Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. 21st of June, creeping in on the end of the month. 621-22 is your date. 621-22 is your date. We are in lesson 476 of the Matthew series. 476 messages into the Gospel of Matthew. And our today's title is, Weak Leaders Allow Weak People to Control Them. Weak Leaders Allow Weak People to Control Them is your title. I just want to make a statement um, related to these things here, the jabs. And, uh, you know, I always do my research and I try to give you as much information. If I find something alarming that I'm concerned about, I let you know. Um, I still will give people, if they need them, the uh, Christian exemption letters. If you've been with me a year and you're part of this congregation, you need to get out of this medical tyranny going on, let me know. Uh, one of the things I'm pretty certain about right now, in the last probably three or four days, I've researched a few things in my spare time. And um, these um, jibber jabs coming out for uh, little kids that they want to put on your child... Is not safe. Do not do it. That's my advice. That's my personal opinion. You do what you want to do. I've heard some horrific things, and I also found out they're saying one thing, but they're really not giving you the fine print, or if they are, you're not reading it. This is still an emergency um, declaration on these things. Emergency means they rushed it. And they're just saying, this is an emergency, we have to do it, whatever happens, happens. Nobody's liable. Big Pharma, nobody's liable. You do what you want to do, but I'm telling you, if you ask me this question, you send me an email, ask me a question about the little kids now getting this, I tell you the same thing with the adults, and I even give you a greater warning, because I'm hearing it's even more uh, devastating for children. They got their whole life ahead of them. They might be stuck with something in their system that causes them some problems. It's a Russian roulette game, folks. You don't know which chamber the bullet is in. That's what I found out over this past year. You do what you want. I'm just putting it out there. But I need to speak the truth to lies. And if I find something out, I can't claim I love you and care about you. And I find things out and I say, I'm not going to say nothing because I don't want to rock the boat. Or it's not my place. Maybe I'm wrong. God will discipline me if I am. I'm, I'm assuming he will. <laughs> so um, having said that, that's all I have to say about that. So if you have any questions, there it is. Uh, we're going to be back in Matthew chapter 27. You guys can go back into Matthew chapter 27. And I think that's all the announcements I have. I just wanted to say that today's title is Weak Leaders Allow Weak People to Control Them. So <laughs> I don't think I fall under the uh, realm of weak leaders. <laughs> I think I'm a little bit rough around the edges. That's who God made me to be. It is what it is. Uh, so anyhow, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow. We all grow in respect to our salvation by taking in the Word of God habitually. Filled with the Spirit, opening up the Christ-like new nature. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10 displays what that means. How to get to that place of opening up that nature, the filling power. 1 John 1, 8, believers. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, here it is, folks. If we confess our sins, believers, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, Washing us clean of all unrighteousness, sins you forgot about or didn't know about. So you name one sin and you're honestly turning to the justice system of God. He washes everything clean in that moment. That's how God works. It's not complicated. First John 1 John 1.10 says, Believer, if you say you have not sinned, you make him a liar. His word is not in you. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Plenty to pray for. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, I'm just asking you to guide people in the area of all this medical tyranny going on, 
the medical lies and confusion, Father. Let people be critical thinkers and get out there, put their thinking caps on, Father, and dig and find out. The, get through the lies of the political elite and the mainstream media, the MSM. Get through that, Father. Help them get through that. Look for and research. Get them curious, Father, to make sure they're making the right decisions for their family and friends. They have to be leaders in their own life, Father. We all have to be leaders in our own life, Father. Give us that guiding light. Only you can give us the truth and the guiding light, Father. We're asking these things. We're asking for your healing hands. With political unrest, social unrest, medical tyranny, lies across this world. Healing across this world, Father, in so many realms. Through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go back into Matthew chapter 27, royal family. Matthew 27. We have taken an in-depth look at suffering. The two forms of suffering in the Christian way of life need to be fully understood, fully digested, as I always tell you. There's deserved suffering. Deserved suffering can lead to divine discipline if the believer does not turn back towards God. So you can get in deserved suffering, and it's not necessarily divine discipline. Remember, divine discipline just doesn't happen like that. I tried explaining that to you more than once in this last series that we got into on suffering. I explained it again. That God is long-suffering, very patient. He lets you go pretty far outside the realm of his uh, plan, I guess we would say, before he starts to knock really hard and warn you. And then eventually, divine discipline will come in. But you can get involved in deserved suffering very easy with your own volitional choices. Your own free will puts you in deserved suffering. Undeserved suffering. Undeserved suffering is what we see happening to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The best example, Jesus Christ, undeserved suffering, part of the plan. Dealing with his mission to save a lost and dying world, obviously it's undeserved suffering. In your lifetime, in my lifetime, speaking to everyone, we will most likely experience both at different points. In your lifetime, my lifetime, we will most likely, all believers, will experience both at different points, deserved and undeserved. Relax. Understand these things. If you understand them, it's much easier to know what to do when you're in it. If you're in deserved suffering, it means you haven't left the plan of God. You're still very connected to God. So you're going through something and you're going to be blessed royally in the end. You're going to be lifted up and you're going to grow and learn during that time. But if you're in undeserved, you're not that connected to God. He's trying to bring you back. So pay attention. The majority of human suffering... Probably 95% is a product of resisting the Word of God. Across the world. How can you say that there's children suffering? Yeah, I would say even in different third world countries. Why do I say that? Because you have to go back to the root. What do those third world country leaders have been doing for 15, 20, 30, 40 years? That have now starved their own children. Do you understand what I'm saying? Go back to the root. So when you see suffering, and I say a statement like this, the majority of human suffering is a product of resisting the word of God and the old sin nature ruling the soul. Across the world, most of it has to do with rejecting Bible doctrine, the truth of the word of God, living in it, and allowing the old sin nature to take control. So when you see suffering in a third world country, and there's people hungry, and there's Fires going on, there's chaos over here, and this country's attacking that one. I would say don't just look at that one incident isolated. Look at the big picture. Go back 10 years, 15 years. What led to that? I can almost guarantee it's rejecting Bible doctrine. Undeserved suffering is reserved for believers headed toward levels of higher spiritual maturity than the average believer. Again, Keep that in mind because we're closing out the suffering. We're getting into something else in Matthew 27. But undeserved suffering is reserved for believers headed upward toward levels of higher maturity than the average believer. Occasionally, not always, very occasionally, rare, an immature believer will get a taste of undeserved suffering to guide them toward applying Bible doctrine and push them toward spiritual growth. I would say it's the rare case that an immature believer is placed in undeserved suffering very early in their walk. 
it's usually deserved or it's usually some form of testing going on. So be careful how you evaluate what's going on in your life. Again, look at self, look in the mirror and trace your steps back over the years. What led you to where you are today in that suffering? God allows us to go through testing all the time and challenges all the time. Sometimes there's nothing going on. Other times you're knee deep in a test or a challenge to push us towards spiritual maturity. That's how we get there, folks. So we will pick it back up in Matthew 27. I hope I clarified that because we're putting a cap. That's it on the end of suffering for today until the Spirit leads me down that trail again. So we're going to pick it back up in Matthew 27, verse 13, and read through until verse 20. So verse 13 through 20, I want to read through. We're going to take a historic look at the portion of the trial, which is getting to the last portion of the trial before Christ goes to the cross. And I want to highlight a few subtle details that many people need to fully grasp and some people overlook them. So I'm just going to give you a couple little details as we get into the lesson today related to this last trial in front of Pilate. Matthew 27, 13 is where we're going to pick it up. Matthew 27, 13. Then Pilate said to him, Jesus, speaking to Jesus, do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? They're shouting and screaming, and they're only 10 or 20 yards away, hollering and yelling and accusing and lying. Not just the Sanhedrin, they've dragged in a lot of the Jewish crowd now. Jesus had already begun to mentally separate. We talked about that. He begun a mental separation from the liars of the Sanhedrin and even the building crowd who were screaming for his death. Jesus was no longer connected to any of that crowd, any of that stuff. He's mentally separated. He's at such a high level of maturity, obviously. It's the humanity of Christ um, that he's able to mentally separate while people are throwing things at him and yelling, he's just standing there calmly, relaxed, all beaten up. And still, this poise about him that's incredible. Matthew 27, 14. And still, he did not answer him in regard to even a single charge. So Pilate's even asking him questions, and Jesus isn't getting into it. So the governor is greatly amazed. He's just looking at this guy's composure. He's like, I cannot believe this. Matthew 27, 15. Now at the Passover feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. I've explained this before. We'll look at it a little bit today. I'm going to show you some historic context that's going to make you go, Oh, now I get it. And you're going to see how some people teach this the wrong way. Remember, I already taught you that this tradition of releasing someone from a debt or a crime during a feast was probably developed. It's hard to trace, but it's probably developed during the period after the Maccabean Revolt when interior changes occurred within the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees after the Maccabean revolt. So after that period of time, they started to maybe allow this to come in where they let uh, a criminal or allow somebody's debt to be gone or whatever it is during a feast. Now, the Roman Empire had a way of doing things after they conquered a people, a culture, a city, they would... Um, let them do their religious feast and, and, and worship their God or whatever, as long as they were paying taxes to Caesar and they submitted to the military, the Roman military and Caesar. But they would also do, and the Romans were famous for this too, is release a criminal on a day of a feast for the people to show how generous they were while they're busy overtaxing them and working them like slaves. But they tried to give them an illusion of freedom. Matthew 27, 16. So you have both Romans and Jews doing this practice. Matthew 27, 16. And at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Bar uh, Barabbas. Notorious is a good word, actually. In the, in the Greek, it really means that. It means somebody really well-known, not in a good way. Matthew 27, 17 on the board. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, pay attention to this, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who's called the Messiah, the Christ? Pontius Pilate's doing this on purpose. You'll see. Matthew 27, 18. For he knew that it was because of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. He knew what was going on. I told you, Pilate was a lot of things, but he was nobody's fool. Pilate is very astute about this whole situation. He knows what's going on. 
He is actually doing a good job trying to not only please the Jewish mob, but also attempt to get Jesus off on a higher sentence. He knows that he knows what they're looking for, death. He's trying to get move Jesus away from that, he which would be a win-win for him. If he could get the people just to say, all right, give him 40 lashes and 30 days in jail or throw him out of the town or whatever, but not kill him, it would kind of be a win-win for Pilate. He's trying to please everybody here. Very smart guy. Not a good, not a good strategy for a leader. You're going to see that. Matthew 27, 19. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, See that you have nothing to do with this righteous man, Jesus Christ. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Pilate's wife, I told you that she did have a dream. It is recorded that that is what was said to him and a note was handed to him that she had had a dream. And there are some scholars, I think, that said she had more than one dream about certain things happening that were like forewarnings of what was coming. So Pilate's wife had been touched in a very supernatural way. We don't know what type of person she was. You can dig around in history, and what you seem to find out is Pilate, his family, his wife, his surrounding uh, group of leaders around him were all unbelievers. They could care less about the Messiah. But she's touched by a very supernatural dream. Dreams can sometimes point us to truth. Pay attention. i got to stay level here so people don't lose their mind. Dreams can sometimes point us to truth or even coming events. Yet not every dream has a deep meaning. Not every dream has a deep meaning. So relax. I can tell you, I told you my sister-in-law passed away a while back. Remember, I traveled to Rhode Island and back and forth. My wife will tell you about five days before I got the phone call that she passed away. I knew she was sick. I had a dream that I was running through an airport. It was a lot of stress and it was difficult. I couldn't get to where I wanted to be. It was one of those dreams you're running, you can't get through the airport, it's crazy. And I knew she was dead. And this was five days before she died. And all I knew was she was in the hospital, sick again, there were problems, it didn't look good. That's all I knew. When I went up to Rhode Island, I had a problem in every airport I went to. When I was going up there, I was stuck. And on the way back, I had to miss three different flights. And I, I came home at 2.30 in the morning instead of at 10 o'clock at night. So, and she passed. So I just, that's just God touching, saying, hey, this is coming up. But there was things on my heart as well. Dreams can sometimes point us to truth or even coming events. Yet not every dream is a deep meaning. You need to grasp this. Sometimes God allows us to have a great vision in a dream. It's biblical. I can't lie to you and tell you it never happens. The problem is most people think every dream means something. Most of the time it does, doesn't. Other times, I would say most of the times, our dreams are based upon the bowl of ice cream you had before you went to bed. You feel me? Let me say that again. Sometimes God allows us to have a vision in our dreams. Sometimes God allows, sometimes. Other times, most of the time, it's because of the bowl of ice cream you had before you went to bed. Amen? And most of the time, it's because you have things on your heart or your soul for a period of time that are pressing you, and they, they manifest themselves in some kind of strange dream. So be careful of how you interpret dreams. Do not get involved in that stuff, and do not get involved in crazy prophecies through your dreams. Be careful not to use dreams as an excuse to make bad choices in your life. Be careful. That's the only warning I'm going to give you because I can't put God in a box. And I've seen in the Bible where certain visions and dreams happen. I've had things happen in my life that I can't put my finger on. And I know God was working in a supernatural fashion. Matthew 27, 20. I could give you several stories. I'm not. But the chief priests, in verse 20, and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. So Barabbas is what you call a polar opposite of Jesus. You want to go to see a good example of polar opposites? I use that term sometimes. Barabbas and Jesus, the humanity of Jesus and Barabbas. The name Barabbas is actually a uh, Greek transliteration, it's called, of a Chaldean or Aramaic name. You can dig around and find Aramaic and Chaldean, and there's a mixed blood there of those two uh, cultures. Barabbas is a Chaldean name, probably Bar, 
means son in Chaldean. It looks like an Abba, Abbas, Abba father means father. Son of the father was his name. That's what his name, that's how he was named. His father named him very simple, son of the father. Barabbas was the leader of a band of hoodlums, though, who had a great reputation for ferocity. What's ferocity? If you don't know what that word is, go look it up. Ferocious. Robbing and looting and, yes, even beating or killing people if he needed to. He was deliberately selected by Pontius Pilate. Deliberately. And put against Jesus Christ because he was the worst gangster in the region. So if he puts up the worst gangster in the region and then puts up this local prophet who really seems like a pretty good guy who hasn't done anything wrong other than upsetting, I almost said the P word, upsetting the Sanhedrin. So you're getting a polar opposite. Look, Pilate did this on purpose. Barabbas is public enemy number one. What was it? Uh, who was the public enemy number one? The uh, John Dillinger back in the day. That's Barabbas in that region. That was Barabbas. So, And you think about it. Jesus and his humanity. Talk about his humanity. Perfect. Perfect. Barabbas, not so much. Never was there a greater contrast between two people. You do that on purpose when you put a contrast like that up. Trust me. Pontius Pilate is setting up a contrast that will leave him an out. He's hoping for an out out of this, an easy out. Certainly the people will ask for the release of Jesus when Barabbas is put up against Jesus. Certainly the Jewish people can't be that bloodthirsty. The Sanhedrin can't be that cold-hearted. Oh, I beg to differ. Because yet we know what happens. Pilate was banking on Barabbas giving him a better option for the sentence of Jesus the carpenter. Didn't work out that way. So there's some confusion also about the use of Barabbas in this trial. That explains it. You have to look at Pontius Pilate, the whole situation. Also, some that teach inaccurately about the day of the trial itself. I've covered this, and this will make it clear, I think, as well. And I think it's important before we move forward, because we're going to be getting into the cross and closing out Matthew before you know it. Who knows when? Not up to me. It's up to the Spirit. The ancient Jewish tradition, pay attention here, was that all feasts are also treated as Sabbaths. Some pulpits don't understand that. They don't teach it. Maybe they gloss over it. Maybe some denominations do too, because they like to do things with Good Friday and this and that, and they explain how Friday Jesus was uh, crucified and hung. And Sorry to tell you, all feasts in the Jewish tradition, ancient times, 2,000 years ago and longer, were treated as Sabbaths. The Sabbath was not only every Saturday, but every feast day was considered a day of rest where you didn't get involved in anything. You rested, which is the word for Sabbath, and you worship the Lord. The Passover depicts the death of Christ on the cross. Everybody understands that. Christ died on the Passover in A.D. 30. Wednesday afternoon, late day. Remember, the days, the Jewish calendar, ancient Jewish calendar, a day began around 6 o'clock when the sun started to set. Just remember that. Sunset to sundown was a full day. But Wednesday was the day. This was a Wednesday morning when all this happened. The second feast is the unleavened bread. You know that. I taught you that. It lasts for seven days. Passover, unleavened bread. We have eight holy days right in a row. That's what you're looking at. Now you have eight holy days right in a row, which means everybody had to have a mentality of Sabbath. They shouldn't be working and doing other things. Their schedule changed like a holiday vacation. Eight days in a row. In the middle of the unleavened bread, many of you know this as well, I taught it, is what's called the first fruits. The first Sunday in the unleavened bread, first fruits, which depicts the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is all pretty simplistic stuff, but this is a good reminder. And it also places some important principles that get overlooked. There are little minute details in all this, but they get overlooked. I want you to take a note on this, understand this. That way you can, when somebody argues with you about Friday, the day of crucifixion, or Wednesday, and how the days worked in the Jewish calendar, and what was going on, and even... Things about why Barabbas was picked. You're going to be able to explain all these things and understand these things. And when people want to just blame Pontius Pilate, you're going to be able to say, well, 
He was weak, and he was used in God's plan as a weak leader, but it really wasn't about him. It was about the Jews rejecting Jesus Christ. So when you see all this, the eight uh, holy days in a row, in the middle of the unleavened bread, which starts at, the, at Passover, you go right into unleavened bread, is what? The first fruits, the first Sunday, the first fruits of unleavened bread, first Sunday, which depicts the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then, 50 days after the first fruits, we see what? What comes after? Really would be like the fourth holiday. It's a bunch of holiday seasons, Jewish tradition holiday seasons. Pentecost, day of Pentecost. Pentecost really means, if you break it apart, five zero fifty. 50 days after the first fruits, we have the fourth one, which is Pentecost. Pentecost simply means 50 days, and it occurred on a Sunday, and the church began on a Sunday. So you have what? Resurrection Sunday, the church beginning on a Sunday, 50 days later. The Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected on a Sunday. The church began on a Sunday. That is why Sunday became a special day for church-age believers. And you have still some people that say, well, Saturday is the Sabbath day. What dispensation are you living in? You can take any day you want for a day of rest or a day with the Lord. I've explained that before. We live in the age of grace. We have a lot of freedom. But Sunday becomes a special day because of these two uh, uh, principles here. Obviously, Jesus Christ, Resurrection Sunday, the first fruits. Jesus Christ, 50 days later, the church, the day of Pentecost, Spirit came down. So Saturday was the day designed for the dispensation of Israel. Saturday was the day designed for the dispensation of Israel. What dispensation do you live in? I wanted to explain that because some people ask questions about that and they're led in a different direction they should be going in. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, do the research. I gave you enough information. Now, between the Roman leadership and the Sanhedrin, this became a tradition between both to release a prisoner during these holy days. This is nothing new. This was not a new tradition. It was already set up for decades before Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. It was already in the works for decades. As I said, they started this sometime after the Maccabean Revolt, this type of attitude of releasing debt or a prisoner possibly on the feasts, and the Romans would also do certain things like this on feasts and holy days for the people that they controlled. This is nothing new. It's going on for decades, long before Jesus stood before Pilate. So God already had this in his plan. That's the way God works. Pontius Pilate was intelligent. But when it came to character, he was weak. Smart, but weak. We have a lot of that in our leadership today, too. That's the truth of Pontius Pilate. Intelligent. Don't sell him short. Manipulative, yes. Arrogant, yes. Weak, yes. But intelligent. Shrewd is a good word. He knew that Jesus was innocent, but he didn't have the strength of character to stand up to the lies. You ever kind of pine for a leadership position? I want to be a manager at my job. I want to be a boss. I want to run my own company. I want to be a pastor. I want to be a church leader. I want to be this, that. I want to be in some form of authority. First and foremost, I tell all of you, you are a leader in your own life. You're going to see that at the beginning of our conference in September. But I can tell you, you are. You're all called to be leaders in some realm or another. But if you want to be a leader of men, men and women, a group of people in a leadership role, I can tell you right now, don't pine over that until you're ready for it. Because he knew, Pilate knew, Jesus was innocent, but he didn't have the strength of character to stand up to the lies going on and the pressure of the crowd. Not a good call. It was Pilate's hidden intention to release Jesus Christ. He was trying to find a way. In this way, he would not have to face the guilty conscience, the guilty thoughts that he knew would spring up later on. He's trying to make everybody happy and get out of it clean. That's not, that's not looking for the truth and looking for a solution in the truth. That's looking to save my own skin. A lot of leaders like to save their own skin. I just want to stay in office, so I'll keep everybody happy. 
I want to get reelected, so I'll say whatever. Got a lot of that today. In this way, he would not have to face any kind of guilt later on. In his mind, he knows Jesus is innocent. You can tell by his actions if you study this enough. He knows Jesus is innocent. But a person who is brilliant, intelligent, whatever you want to call him, yet has a weak character or lacks true integrity, can never face the true issue when pressure is applied. Again, we have a lot of this, certainly in politics across the world, but here in America. This type of person makes a horrible leader. I would rather have a leader who seeks the truth and speaks a little rough around the edges and steps on some toes and hurts some feelings, but gets the job done the right way than somebody who gives me a lot of fluff and nonsense and pleases the majority. This type of person makes a horrible leader and spends their whole life avoiding true issues, pleasing people, and ends up miserable in the end. They always do. They think they're going to save their own skin or come out, come across looking like the hero. You got a lot of pastors. I hate to say this, but maybe I don't hate to say it, but maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Again, God will give me a spanking for saying it, maybe. A lot of pastors who do a lot of nice, fluffy things that make everybody feel good. And they're very politically correct. They won't say anything against anything. So they teach the Bible in a very narrow framework of political correctness, not to hurt anybody's feelings. Horrible leaders. Horrible leaders. Yeah, I said it. I couldn't believe I heard the other day, I think it was a couple of churches up in Canada, but I think there was some in America that were involved in the 5013C, you know, all this uh, get the tax exempt and all that, but Uncle Sam gets to tell you what to do, that were actually getting money, there's a lot of them that I found out, some rejected it, to promote this in people's arms. It's getting paid. Getting government funds, extra grants, all kinds of favors and money. Hmm. That's somebody you really want to sit under. That's somebody you really want to sit under. You can really trust them. Let me let that go. Those who attempt to fly under the radar and never want to take a stand or never want to feel uncomfortable about what they believe in or speaking their mind live in silent misery. They live in silent misery usually. And I'm not saying that you should go out and hit people over the head with your opinion. You need to be careful about that. Speak truth when it's asked and when the timing is right. But speak truth. People pleasers become miserable and weaker as time goes on. Doesn't matter if you're a leader or not. People pleasers become miserable and weaker as time goes on. The longer they stay like this, the worse off they become. Leaders who attempt to stand in authority like this hurt not only themselves, but everyone under their authority. Leaders who want to attempt to stand in this type of authority, like the example Pontius Pilate has given you, leaders who attempt to stand in that type of authority hurt not only themselves, but everybody under their authority. It catches up along the way. What did I say about rejecting Bible doctrine? Everybody suffers in the long run. Don't ask why this village over here in this third world country is under attack and there's suffering and there's no food over there or this is going on, that's going on. I would suggest take a look at the decisions that the leaders and different people have made along the way and maybe those people are going through some undeserved suffering because of their leadership. But I can guarantee you, you can trace it back to deserved suffering because of decisions made away from the plan of God. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility for what they made years ago and now standing in today. Remember that the religious crowd kept on accusing Jesus vehemently, very angrily. The mob mentality, we've covered that one quite a bit in the last year or so. Mob mentality always bullies and religion was bullying Pontius Pilate, plain and simple. They can't bully, bully Jesus Christ. It doesn't work with a spiritually mature person. He will not respond. And he wasn't anymore. He had 
separated from them mentally and physically who's standing right in front of them. Jesus stands in the predatorium with calm dignity that only comes from divine viewpoint, and Pontius Pilate's kind of blown away by his calm dignity in all of this. Well, like I said, blood is coming down his face, and people are shouting for his death, and you get a sense you got an innocent guy in front of you. Calm dignity from divine viewpoint. Jesus shows complete strength and control in a horrible and aggressive environment. A lot of people don't see strength and control, real strength and control and power when somebody stands there and they're kind of being abused or wrongly accused. But there is great strength, power, and self-control and discipline and all of that in a horribly aggressive environment. He will not answer a word to the lies. He will not answer the angry mob. He has shut them out. Jesus is mentally and emotionally separated from religion now. I told you that. Also, he's separated from the anger and hate, even though just 10 yards away, as I told you, it's directed right at him. People are trying to spit, shout, and throw things at him. Not just words. The religious leaders are bullies because of legalism. Yet they do not succeed against the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They bully Pontius Pilate easily because he's weak. I explained to you that. We see that. Because many of the men of the Sanhedrin knew he was easily compromised anyway. They knew Pontius Pilate wasn't exactly in great standings with Caesar. Once a weak leader is exposed, he or she will be a target from that point forward. If you're a leader at your job, any kind of role of leadership, maybe you own your own business, I don't know, maybe you're going to become a pastor. But I can tell you, once a weak leader is exposed, he or she will be a target from that point forward. It's almost better for a leader to stand up very strong and make a few enemies, as long as he's standing in truth and what is right than to kind of go along and get along. Because now you got a big bullseye on your back. It's never going to end. The religious leaders go to the mob. And they gather the mob. Their fault. They're gathering it. It's the mob who cries Barabbas, really. They, get, they whipped up the mob. You see, they, they're so manipulative that they don't even, they aren't the ones all oh, oh, crying out Barabbas. So they don't look that guilty, the leaders of the Sanhedrin. But they whipped everybody up into a frenzy. They set this whole thing up. Kind of like the January 6th trial. The final step in manipulating people or crushing weak authority is getting louder and gathering emotional people to stand with you. It's a little trick a lot of people use. The final step in manipulating people or crushing weak authority is getting louder and gathering emotional people to stand with you. Whip up those around you. Get some people involved. This is a key strategy of destroying law and order. Fire up the crowd. You'll destroy law and order in the long run. Get everybody fired up. Get the emotions going. We're going to be closing today looking at some statements and the attitude of a young guy named David, many of you know. 1 Samuel chapter 17, royal family. Go ahead over to the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to cover some more principles in Matthew 27 and then we're going to finish up today reading some of David's statements, and I'm going to show you something about real confidence. 1 Samuel 17. In Matthew 27, 17, while you're going to 1 Samuel, Therefore, when they were gathered together, it says, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want? Polar opposites. He's doing it on purpose. This means, what's your choice? What's your volition? What's your decision? What are you thinking about, people? He is now going to get an expression of desire from the people. It shows what they truly want. You can get an idea what they want. You kind of hang it out in front of them, and you'll see what they go for. Matthew 27, 17, whom do you want, it says. Thalo is the word. Whom do you want? It's a term, what do you want? Thalo. Who do you want me to release, he's saying. This puts it directly upon the crowd, the Jews that are there, who had gathered. And it looks directly at what? It's a mirror of their free will, their decisions, their volition, their desire is on display. 
You kind of hang it out there and you'll see what they really want. Thelu is a Greek verb meaning a strong desire. Something deep inside that's been churning. A desire, that which pleases someone. I really want that. In other words, it's a thought sparked by deep desire. You know what it is? It's a danger because if you're not allowing the thought and the thinking to stay in control and you have a desire and your thinking and desire are starting to mix and the desire starts overpowering the thinking, you don't think it through and you just let the emotions and desire come out. That's what we have. It's a thought sparked by deep desire. They express the decision through emotions taking control. The decision of the mob is always an emotional decision. I've taught you mob mentality in recent months. The decision of the mob is always an emotional decision. It's what they wanted. They thought about it. But they didn't think about it in a rational sense. They thought about it and allowed the emotions to start sparking with their desires and lust patterns and let it go free. You got a rabid, you know, pit bull like wild dog and you whip it all up and then let the collar go. The decision of the mob is always an emotional decision. It is never a rational decision. It may be something they wanted to do, obviously thinking about it. They had a desire for it, but they had no courage to speak it out loud until they whipped into a frenzy. They didn't have the courage before, but now everybody else. We're all whipped up into a frenzy. I got a bunch of people with me. Mob mentality. Mob mentality encourages emotion, folks. That's why you get warnings from good pastors that tell you don't get involved in a lot of crazy Christian activism out there that looks like it's going to be for a good cause. Everybody's emotional and they're marching around and doing all this crazy stuff. Be careful of that. Most of that's not part of the plan of God, I can tell you right now. There's occasionally you have to get involved in certain things, but if you don't do it the right way and your emotions get out of hand and it's mob mentality, you're in the wrong. Mob mentality encourages emotions to erupt and overthrow any thought, any good thoughts, any good decisions. It gives a sense of false courage and pseudo-righteousness, pseudo-justice, because others are chanting alongside of you, you're oh so right. We must be right. The mob shouting and yelling, the TV told me I'm in the right. The mainstream media said I'm right. <laughs> Be careful about what you agree with and let whip you up into a frenzy. Those involved in this mob mentality would never act alone. Get them by himself. See what they do. Occasionally, they'll let their emotions go so crazy because they're psychopaths now that they might snap. But for the most part, they're not going to do what they do in a crowd. Those involved in this mob mentality would never act alone. Even though they think and desire about certain aggressive actions, they do not have the strength for the most, most part or the courage to stand strong by themselves and speak their, their truth, what they think is true. It always comes down to crowds and violence and acts of aggression. But most part, they don't have real courage to stand in what they believe. They don't have real courage, not divine courage. There's a great difference between false courage of mob mentality or the act of courage inside the cosmic system and having true divine courage. Let me say that one again. There is a great difference between the false courage of mob mentality or even the act of courage that a lot of people think they do inside the cosmic system and really having true divine courage. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I've explained this before. This is a great example coming up. There may be no greater example, actually, in ancient history than a young man just out of his teens named David. Many of you know the story. This is the story when the vicious Nephilim, Goliath, called out the nation of Israel. David ignored the size and power of this famous giant. He wasn't impressed by nine and a half, ten foot giant with a reputation for beating and killing everybody. This is a display of divine courage. Everyone else in the military, his brothers, all the other grown men who had been trained, 
couldn't take their eyes off the size and the strength of the problem Goliath in front of them. David's eyes were not on the size and strength of the problem. David's eyes were on the size and the strength of his God. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, 32. You know, it's the old saying, don't focus on the problem, focus on the solution. We know the solution. 1 Samuel 17, 32. Look at verse 32. We're just going to go over some of these statements because if you didn't know and study and realize David's a man after God's own heart. You might think he's being a little cocky or arrogant in a cosmic way. He is not. 1 Samuel 17, 32. And David said to King Saul, May no one's heart fail on account of him. In other words, David is genuinely concerned about the men in the military. He sees they're crumbling under pressure. This is the military that God put together to protect God's people in God's land. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine, exclamation point, meaning David wasn't kidding. 1 Samuel 17, 33, but Saul said to David, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight him, for you're only a youth. You weren't prepared, you weren't trained. You just got out of high school, David, basically. <laughs> While he has been a warrior since his youth. Like I told you before, there's some people in scholars and theologians that argue David was 17 years old or maybe 23 years old, but I can tell you David wasn't barely out of high school from what I could gather. Same age as the guys that go in the military, amen? Young men and women that go in our military. He's been a warrior since his, his youth. In other words, Goliath already had a reputation, not only his size and strength, he already had a reputation of winning every battle he's been in. David was not speaking from false hope. David was not speaking from a bloated ego. He was speaking from a place of confidence in God. Much more important to understand that. In fact, his love and relationship with God was so strong, he actually felt insulted that anyone would call out the God of Israel. Insulted. Because he loved God so much. A man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 17, 34, but David said to Saul, your servant still understanding the chain of command. He knows he probably can't, doesn't even belong there, but God's going to use him and he's very sure he's going to be used. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending to his father's business, the sheep, when a lion or a bear came and took a sheep from the flock. I can tell you right now, David's not bragging. This is not bragging. Sometimes you have to speak truth like that. And some people think, well, what are they trying to do, brag? It's not bragging. He's simply stating the truth. He's stating his case. Proper chain of command. Putting it in front of the chain of command. I believe it is this moment like this. This exact moment that David realized all the training God already gave him for this combat situation. David was in great shape. He's walking across the countryside every day, miles and miles and miles with the sheep and he's got to protect them by himself against all kinds of wolves and bears and lions and who knows whatever else, robbers. David's been trained without even realizing. Most of you are being trained for something you don't even realize. 1 Samuel 17, 35, I went out after it and I attacked it. I didn't run from the bears and lions and the wolves and the robbers on the road and in the mountains when I was taking care of my dad's sheep the family business, I fought and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I grabbed it by its mane, struck it, and killed it. David had been doing that since he was about 14 years old. No one was there for David to impress when he was fighting bears, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. <laughs> he had to summon up real courage, which comes from a place of strength in our relationship with God wasn't about impressing anybody. There's nobody to impress when you're by yourself like that. Yet he did it. And he knows he did it. He's stating truth. He's stating his case to the authority. 1 Samuel 17, 36. Your servant has killed, matter of fact statement, both the lion and the bear. Possibly more than one. And this uncircumcised Philistine, unbeliever you could put there, will be like one of them. 
since he's defied the armies of the living God, my God, the one I know and love and worship. This could be misconstrued as arrogance, and it shouldn't be. Could be misconstrued as arrogance, but it's not. Yet if you really study this, you would see it is divine courage that can only be achieved by placing your whole life in the hands of God and knowing he will come through for you. If you really understand this and study and listen to what I'm telling you, what David's simply saying is, I've put my whole life in the hands of God, and he trains me and shows me what to do, and I just follow through with it. And God takes care of it every time. 1 Samuel 17, 37. And David said, the Lord who saved me. David did the fighting. David fought the lions and the bears. David kept the sheep safe. Why doesn't he say, I did it? David said, this is divine courage. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He just said that he grabbed the mane, he killed it. Paying attention, folks? He will save me from the hand of the Philistine. Paying attention? People that want to just sit on their hands and say, well, I'm just supposed to sit and wait for the rapture. I don't know. Is that what God's telling you? God, David could have just, I'm just going to wait on God. He'll save that sheep while the lion rips it apart. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, he will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go, may the Lord be with you. Saul's like, all right, just get out of here. Somebody's got to go out there and get killed in front of this Goliath and we'll figure out what we need to do next. He was assuming David's going to get crushed. Just go ahead. You'll find that King Saul, if you study on him, we talk about weak leaders, sadly a believer. Real divine courage is dependent upon spiritual strength, not fleshly arrogance. Spiritual strength, not fleshly arrogance. When you and I can reach a point of maturity where we simply put all our life in God's hands, money, wealth, health, family, everything in God's hands, and no matter what the outcome, what the battle looks like, we accept God is in control, then we will experience divine courage, and he may say, step up, go into the land of giants like he did with Joshua and Caleb, and take it. I'm with you. You got this. When you reach a point, or I reach a point, any believer reaches a point of maturity where we simply put our whole life into God's hands. Money, health, wealth, family, career, everything. And no matter what the outcome or what the battle looks like, win, lose, or draw, we accept that God's in control. We can start experience real divine courage. 1 Samuel 17, 38, Then Saul clothed David with the cosmic system. That's what you can look at that. So I was like, I'll figure it out. Dr. Phil and Oprah have the answers, even though I'm a believer. 1 Samuel 17, 38, Then Saul clothed David with his military attire, put a bronze helmet on him, outfitted him with armor. armor. King Saul was a believer. Weak leader, but a believer. He was dependent upon the flesh, upon the things of the world, upon the solutions in the world. He wasn't really grasping the spiritual nature in all this. 1 Samuel 17, 39, and David strapped on his sword. He's trying to follow the authority, which is fine, until you find the authority is leading you in the wrong direction. I must follow God rather than men. 1 Samuel 17, 39, David strapped on his sword over his military attire, struggling to walk. David was built kind of scrawny, wasn't exactly a big physical specimen, actually very athletic, but probably skinny and young. Strapping on a military tie, struggling to walk, for he had not trained with the armor. So David said to Saul, I have enough discernment, a Bible doctrine in my soul. I'm going to say no to your authority and do what God shows me. I cannot go with these because I have not trained with them. And David took them off. Real divine courage is trained into your system. 
trained into your system by a close relationship with the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine, your Bible, the Word of God, filling power of God, the Holy Spirit, trained into your system. Don't look for it to happen overnight. It's a journey. When you know something doesn't feel right because it does not align with Bible doctrine and it feels like it doesn't fit right, you shake it off and go in the direction God is leading you, not follow what others are doing, even if it's leadership. When you know something doesn't feel right, not emotions, I'm talking with thought, because it doesn't align with Bible doctrine. This doesn't line up with the Word of God, and yet everybody else is doing it. The leaders are telling me they're doing it. I need to follow God, not man. Shake it off. Go in the direction God is leading you, not following what others are doing. 1 Samuel 17.40 goes on to say, Then he took his staff in his hand, chose for himself five smooth stones. I explained that to you already. He wasn't worried about missing because he was an expert. He was trained over time. Remember I told you Goliath's brothers, or brothers, plural, and sons. And one of the brothers may have been, I think it was Nate that sent me some information on that, may have been like 20 feet tall or higher. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, look, he's all prepared. He knows preparation, responsibility. That is in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. Divine courage demands what? Responsibility, folks. Training. Divine courage demands responsibility and training. Self-discipline and preparedness are the trademark of a real courageous Christian. But what about big muscles? And what about, uh, you know, I feel like I can kick butt or I'm going to run and do this because it feels good. No. Self-discipline, preparedness, training, making sure you're focused. That's the trademarks of a courageous Christian. Real courage. The illusion for the weak believer is that they can live in cosmic viewpoint or emotions. And when the time comes, they can just cry out to God, sit back, and God will do all the work for them. How did God kill the bear and the lion or anybody else or anything else that David had to protect those sheep? God came through for David. But it says David grabbed the mane and killed. Because David was well prepared and listening to God. The illusion for the weak believer is that they can live in cosmic viewpoint or emotions, whatever. And when the time comes, they'll just cry out to God. Sit back while God does all the work for him. I truly never see that anywhere in the Bible. I've repeated that a lot recently. Never see that anywhere in the Bible. David's a great example of that. What about Moses? What about Noah? The ark didn't build itself. What about Joshua and Caleb? The list goes on and on right up to the apostles. So don't tell me. You just cry out to God, he's going to fix everything. God wants you prepared along the way. And when he says, step up and do something over here, step up and do it. 1 Samuel 17, 45. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, a saber. You got all this gear. But I come to you because I'm so good. I'm a good fighter. I killed lions and bears and I trained. No, no, no. I come to you in the name of the Lord of armies. Always goes back to God, you notice? The God of the armies of Israel, whom you defy. Therefore, I'm in the right, you're in the wrong. Your courage always relates back to divine power. God working in your favor, nothing to do with your flesh. God working in your favor, nothing to do with your flesh. Absorb this, what I'm telling you, folks. This is important for your for your life going forward, certainly in the climate we're in here in America and across the world, but things are going to happen this summer and into the fall. Trust me when I tell you. Fighting or standing strong for the Lord rejects anything from the flesh. 
Fighting or standing strong in the Lord rejects anything from the flesh. So if your emotions are getting the best of you, it's probably not the Lord leading you. David actually had a calm assurance. Like Jesus standing there, beaten and accused. Calm assurance. 1 Samuel 17, 46. This day, matter of fact statement, the Lord will hand you over to me. 10 feet tall, you know, 600, 800 pounds, whatever. <laughs> I'll strike you and remove your head from you. David just doesn't say, I'm going to defeat you. Let me let you in on a little secret, Goliath, you giant that everybody's afraid of. I'm not only going to kick your butt, I'm going to remove your head from your shoulders. Then I'll give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky, the wild animals of the earth. Pretty detailed description. So that all the earth may know I'm a badass. It's not what he says. So that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And yeah, I said the A word. Grow up. I don't teach to little children. I teach to adults. This is not boasting. This is not boasting and pride. This is divine courage. Believers will never have this courage working strong in their life until they get to a serious relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You want that kind of divine courage? Grow up. How do I grow up? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word. Filling power of the Spirit. The Word. Filling power of the Spirit. The Word. Weak believers have a choice to accept cosmic viewpoint to build themselves up or God's Word to build them up. Either or. The great thing about this, there's no middle ground, there's no gray area. Either or. Weak believers have a choice. Keep accepting that cosmic viewpoint, human viewpoint, emotions, what Dr. Phil and Oprah teach you. Or build yourself up in the Word of God, either or. There's no middle ground, pretty simple. God keeps things more simple than we realize. We complicate it. The, you know, I used to do meetings a long time ago, many of you know. And they used to tell you, the KISS principle works. What's the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid. You can never build up divine courage absorbing both viewpoints. You will not. That is a journey into confusion that keeps a believer in a position of weakness. That explains a lot in Christianity today. If people's opinions easily sway your decisions, you are in a position of weakness. If people's opinions easily sway your decisions, you are in a position of weakness, period. There's no other explanation. And we've all been there probably at one time or another. So I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilt or shame. If that's what you're getting, you're not getting convicted. You're getting condemned. That's your flesh. You're hypersensitive. You're being subjective instead of objective. If people's opinions easily sway your decisions, you are in a position of weakness. If you recognize that, that's a good place to be. When you recognize something and say, you know what, I kind of do that. That's just God, the Holy Spirit, knocking and saying, make some changes. Your choice. Great thing about free will, every day you wake up and make a new choice. Or make the same good choices or bad choices. If Bible doctrine is the deciding factor in your life, if Bible doctrine is the deciding factor in your life, other people's opinion will have no sway over you. That's where you want to get to. Every believer is called to be a strong leader of their own life. I can't tell you how powerful God the Holy Spirit is putting that on my soul. I, I just can't. I can't explain it to you. That in the last six months, it's just building and building and building. Every time I go to pray and put my notes together and study, I keep getting this pressure, uh, pressure on me, good pressure from God, the Holy Spirit, saying, you better teach them to be, learn to be leaders in their own life. Every, uh, everybody is called to be a leader. Everybody. Well, I'm just 17 years old and I got born again and saved last year. You're a leader in your life. You are given a leadership role. 
in this combat, in this warfare, in your life. If Bible doctrine is the deciding factor in your life, other people's opinion will not sway over you. Every believer is called to be a strong leader of their own life. And then it's going to be other roles of leadership. Trust me, as time goes on. That demands divine courage because the cosmic system is set to oppose God's nature and confuse the truth. Satan's system is set up to oppose everything about the nature, the personality of God, and the truth of God. This is why Satan promotes what? Counterfeits for every aspect of God's plan and God's nature. That's why the counterfeits are out there. They're designed to look like they're from God. They're designed to look like they're spiritual. They're designed to look like they would fit in the nature of God somehow or another. And yet they're counterfeits. But if you don't study the real, you'll never understand the counterfeit. You'll fall for everything. It's the old saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. Well, if you don't stand for truth and Bible doctrine and really study it and understand it, you'll fall for everything. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. For your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.